Farming. Fishing. Foraging. Mining. Combat. These are the five skills that live in harmony in the valley. Only the farmer, master of all five skills, can bring economic prosperity to Pelican Town. This may be controversial, but I would say that my favorite skill in the game is mining. Because what's the point of farming if in the downtime you don't have something exciting to do while waiting for your crops to grow? Now you may say that the guides for mining and combat ought to be combined, but let me assure you that there's plenty of separate mechanics that it's worth going over individually. So with that said, here is the table of contents. First, we're gonna go through the overall mining mechanics. Then we'll have a section for rocks and tools, which is extensive, I guarantee you. That's all we'll cover this video. Next time, we'll talk about the dungeons and level up rewards. This took a lot longer than I thought it would. So first of all, what exactly constitutes mining? Basically, breaking a rock. Whether it's with a pickaxe or a bomb, or even from an enemy's explosion, it makes no difference. Breaking a rock is the one and only way of gaining mining experience. Rocks can provide all sorts of materials, like things needed for crafting, like stone or ores. Geodes that can be broken open give you even more materials or things to donate to the museum. And valuable gems that can either be sold for profit or make great gifts to many of the villagers around town. And each of those resources have a machine related to them. Your first mining machine is the furnace. This is probably the first one you'll unlock once you obtain copper ore from any source. Clint will visit you the next day and give you the crafting recipe for it. It's made with copper and stone, and this is the way that you're going to turn your raw ore into bars. Not only do bars sell for more money than the raw materials used to make it, but it's also required to upgrade all of your tools and make some of the best crafting recipes in the game. And to smelt, all you need is five of the raw ore and one coal, put it into the furnace, and depending on the rarity of the material, it'll take either a short or very long time to smelt, ranging from taking 30 in-game minutes for copper all the way to nine hours and 20 minutes for the extremely late game radioactive ore. Of course, we'll be going over the exact areas to get these ores later in the video. That's not the only thing you can put into furnaces though. Quartz and fire quartz, which can just be found lying on the grounds of the mines, can be smelted into refined quartz. Regular quartz making one refined quartz and fire quartz making three. These are also used for many crafting recipes in the game. Although it should be noted that refined quartz isn't liked by any characters, but fire quartz is a universal like for everyone except for Leah, Linus, and Pierre. The last thing you can put in the furnace is a bouquet. Normally the bouquet is used to start dating someone that you have eight hearts with. However, if you wish to stop dating someone, you can put it into the furnace, it'll quickly turn into a wilted bouquet, and you can give that to whoever you would like to stop dating. Our next machine is the Geode Crusher. For the cost of one piece of coal, you can use this to crush a piece of geode to find out what is inside. It's a pretty late unlock though. You'll have to play until fall when you unlock the special orders board, and then you'll have to wait for Clint to put his special order Cave Patrol on the board. And after that, you'll be given the crafting recipe for the Geode Crusher. Lucky us, up until that point, you can just go into the blacksmith shop and pay Clint 25 gold to open the geode for you and coal can be a pretty scarce resource depending on the way you play, so this is the preferred option for many players anyway, even after unlocking the Geode Crusher. Each type of geode, regular, frozen, and magma, has its own set of minerals that it can contain. There's a couple of basic resources like stone or copper ore that they all share though. The Omni Geode is a bit of a special case. It's fairly rare and has a low chance to be found at any level of the mines, and has the ability to contain any mineral from any of the three previous kinds of geodes, as well as having a low 1 in 250 chance for a prismatic shard, which the other geodes don't have. There are two geodes beyond this that are a bit rarer than all of the others. The Artifact Trove only has three sources, as a trade for five Omni Geodes at the Desert Trader, a low chance to drop from the Haunted Skull enemy, and it can be found from Artifact Spots on Ginger Island, which is a pretty late game area. It has a chance of containing many different artifacts that are unique to just it, so you'll have to at least find a few of these to complete the museum. The next geode we'll talk about is a little spoilerish for Ginger Island, so go ahead and skip through the geode section if you wouldn't like to see that. Alright, 
the golden coconut can only be found on Ginger Island. Your best chance is getting it from shaking down coconuts from a coconut tree. It can also rarely be found by digging up artifact spots, and after you've cracked open your first one, you can trade 10 regular coconuts for one golden coconut at the island trader. It basically contains a bunch of exclusive items to Ginger Island, such as the two new tree saplings, the two new crops, mahogany seeds, and the golden helmet. It also has a chance of containing iridium ore, or the fossilized skull, which is required if you want to collect all of the golden walnuts from Ginger Island. Speaking of which, the first golden coconut you break open will always contain one golden walnut. Also, just a quick tip about geodes. The items that you get from geodes are predetermined by your save file seed. It's basically a super long list that you go through in sequential order. The thing is, the list for opening geodes through the geode crusher is one position behind the list for the blacksmith. So, if you break open a geode and get something super rare, such as a prismatic shard, if you open up that same type of geode in a geode crusher immediately after, you'll get the same item. Use that to your advantage. Moving on to the last type of machine, the Crystallarium. This one's pretty simple. It's very expensive to make, and it isn't even unlocked until level 9 mining, but you can just put any gem you like into it to duplicate it over a certain amount of time. Generally, the rarer the gem, the longer it takes to duplicate. Basically, anything that's on the Minerals tab of your Collections page can be duplicated. But if you're wondering what's best to duplicate, if you're looking for straight up money, the diamond is your best bet. Not only do you only have to check the Crystallarium once every five days, but it just straight up gives you the best gold per day. As for other items you might like to duplicate, each of the other main gems have a good item that you can trade for at the Desert Trader. You can get spicy eels from rubies, which are great for spelunking, cloth from aquamarine, which has its uses, cheese from emeralds, which is a good food item, and probably most importantly, you can trade one jade for a staircase, which basically sends you down a floor in the mines or the skull cavern for free. This is the way that many people with an aversion to mining get through the mines. You just set up a bunch of crystallariums with jades, trade them all for staircases on Sundays, and profit. Any of the other gems have their niche uses, like as a loved item for some characters, but you'll generally not be duplicating them too often. Personally, as opposed to making money, I think quartz are great for duplicating, since you can trade five of them for a bomb at the Desert Trader. Also, if you ever want the original gem that you put into the Crystallarium back out, just break the Crystallarium with the pickaxe and you'll get it back. And real quick before we move on to the tools and rocks, let's talk a little bit more about the blacksmith. This is your main shop for anything mining related. As I said earlier, you can break open geodes here. It's going to be your main way of breaking open geodes throughout the entire game. You can buy copper, iron, and gold ore along with coal, although I'd say the prices are very high, especially after year one when most of the prices double. But it can be a good emergency source if you really need it. And then you can also upgrade most of your tools here. Each tool has a copper, steel, gold, and iridium upgrade, which either makes the tool much more efficient at breaking whatever it's supposed to break, or in the case of the hoe and the watering can, gives it a larger range in one use. You also have the trash can here, which was added in version 1.4. Upgrading the trash can allows you to get a little bit of the money back from any item that you throw in the trash. The copper trash can gives you 15% of the value, steel gives you 30%, gold gives you 45%, and iridium gives you 60%. Also, note that these tool upgrades are some of the most costly items in the game. Not only do you need 5 of whatever bar you're upgrading to, but copper will cost 2,000 gold, steel will cost 5,000, gold will cost 10,000, and each iridium tool will take you 25,000 gold. And one last thing, I find visiting the blacksmith a good time to gift Clint some items. He loves all of your basic gems, excluding diamonds for some reason, and he also loves gold and iridium bars. He's really easy to find gifts for. And once you do start becoming friends with him, he'll start sending you copper, iron, and gold bars in the mail, so super useful friendship there. Now it's time to finally move on to talking about the pickaxes and rocks. Except not, because we also have bombs! These are extremely useful for when you're going mining because they can allow you to break multiple rocks at once without using energy to swing your pickaxe. There's three tiers of bombs, the cherry bomb, the bomb, and the mega bomb, each with increasingly large explosion radiuses. 
you'll unlock the crafting recipes for them as you go up in mining level. Certain enemies have them as drops, and you can also buy them from the dwarf after you've donated the four dwarf scrolls to the museum and blown up the rock blocking his shop. So as I stated earlier, upgrading your pickaxe makes it easier to break rocks. Before I started working on this video, I assumed that it reduced the amount of hits that every rock takes by one. That is not true in the slightest. So I tested everything myself and I made a chart. This is a chart of every single type of small rock in the game, along with every pickaxe and how many hits it takes to break them. As you can see, most rocks going from the regular pickaxe to the copper pickaxe halves the amount of hits it takes making the copper pickaxe the most important upgrade to get. Comparatively, going from the gold pickaxe to the iridium pickaxe doesn't really change that much. In fact, you'll notice that iridium nodes still take the same amount of hits, despite it being as high of a number as four. Although if we look at Skull Cavern Rocks, which is the fourth one on the list, those go from two hits to one, which is actually a very important number to go down on. So let's start talking about all these rocks, why don't we? For our first section, we have regular rocks. Each of these correlate to a certain biome in the mines, or the Skull Cavern and then the Volcano, each of them taking more and more hits as you move on. First, I've listed how much experience each rock gives you, although there is a bit of a discrepancy for these first five rocks. If you look at the items that these rocks drops, you'll see that each of them have a chance to drop a geode, coal, or their material for that floor. If you get a coal drop from any of these rocks, it increases the amount of experience you get by five. So, for example, the rocks in the mines will go from 0 experience to 5 experience. Skull Cavern and Volcano rocks will go from 1 experience to 6. And the rocks on your farm? Completely different kind of rocks from these. They'll always give you 1 experience, and then give you 6 with coal. Also, regular rocks have the most amount of dropped items in the game, so much that I couldn't really show them all. What you see on this list are the very common drops. However, any rock in the mines has a very small chance to drop Omnigeodes. And even though they commonly drop their ore associated with that set of floors, they also have a small chance of dropping ore from other floors. And when it comes to the Skull Cavern rocks, they have a chance of dropping any of the previous types of ores and any of the previous types of geodes. Surprisingly though, this isn't true for volcano rocks. They can straight up only drop stone and coal. Moving on to the next set of stones, we have our ores. Copper, iron, gold, iridium, and the extremely late game radioactive ore. Now copper ore nodes are commonly found on floors 1 to 40 in the mines. Iron nodes are commonly found 40 to 80, and gold nodes found from floors 80 to 120. You do still have a low chance of finding previous floors nodes in a later floor though, so you could be in the ice caverns 40 to 80 and still find copper nodes, they're just not as common. And same goes for iron and copper in the magma floor. Iridium nodes only start to show up once you get to the Skull Cavern, which is the second dungeon of the game. We'll go over it later. The Skull Cavern also has the possibility of spawning any of the previous ore nodes. Now the radioactive node is something that's a little special. So special that it's a bit of a spoiler and we'll talk about it later. Talking about this group as a whole, you'll notice that iridium nodes are one of the best rocks to break if you're gunning for level 10 mining, since it gives a whopping 50 experience every time you break it. Comparatively, radioactive nodes surprisingly only give you 18. And I'm pretty sure I'm the first person on earth to do this, it takes 25 hits with the regular pickaxe to break a radioactive node, and that gets halved all the way down to 13 hits with the copper pickaxe. Moving on, we have three types of gem nodes. I did group up all of the regular gems into one spot since there's six of them and they would make this guide a lot messier, but they're all pretty simple. So just so you know, amethyst and topaz can be found on any floor of the mines. Jade and aquamarine can only be found starting from floor 40, and rubies and emeralds can only be found starting from floor 80. And those floors are what determine how much experience they give. Each gem node just gives their gem, and they all take the same amount of hits, starting at five with the regular pickaxe. The diamond node is special because it is a diamond, the most valuable of all of the minerals, and it gives the highest amount of experience in the game at 150, 
So absolutely gun for these, even if you don't want the diamond. And it takes 10 hits to break initially. They can be found on floors 50 or higher in the mines, although they are much rarer than any other gem node. Although funny enough, it is the only regular gem that can spawn on floors of multiple of 5, I can only assume from an oversight. This purple stone that you see next is simply called a gem node, and it randomly gives you one of the 6 common gems. Thing is, it still gives you the experience of whatever gem comes out. The only difference between it and the other gem nodes is the fact that it can be found on any floor, so you could theoretically get a ruby on floor 6 of the mines. And it only takes 4 hits initially as opposed to 5. And it can also be found on any floor of the Skull Cavern. So moving on from here, once again this is going to be about Ginger Island stuff, so if you don't want too many spoilers, I'd skip the rest of the rocks guide. So first we have Muscle Nodes. These spawn on the beach on the west side of Ginger Island, and as expected, they give you Muscles. Each one you break also has a chance of having a Golden Walnut until you've gotten 5 Golden Walnuts from the Muscles altogether. Not really much more to say about those other than they take a surprising amount of hits for, you know, just a Muscle. Bone Nodes can be found on the Dig Site. There's two different colors of these Bone Nodes, but they both act the same. As the name implies, these give bones, and I've just written bones there because it gives so many different kinds of items that it'd be impossible to put in that small little square. On to the last node, the clay node! This is possibly the least notable of them all. It also spawns on the dig site, and it just gives you clay. Yes, the same clay that you can hoe up out of the ground anywhere. The next two rocks we have are exclusive to the Volcano Dungeon. First we have Cinder Shard Nodes, which of course give you Cinder Shards. These will be used as a form of currency up at the Forge, which if you want to know more about that, I have a whole separate guide about it. Can also be traded for a couple of items at the Dwarf Shop in the middle of the Volcano Dungeon, and are used for one crafting recipe. I would also be amiss if I didn't mention that it does make one of the best hats in the game. Next up we have an Omni Geode node, which is the only geode node that naturally spawns in the game without the use of a specific farm. It's really rare and gives you the second most experience out of all the rocks in the game. As you could probably guess, when you break it open, it gives you a couple of Omni Geodes, which we've gone over before. So that covers all of the rocks, and I know what you're thinking. God, I wish there were more rocks. Lucky for you, there's some that I didn't include. First, there's the boulders, which, no matter where you break them on your farm in the caves anywhere, give you no experience, but they'll always give you 10 stone. Although, for the ones on your farm, you will need the steel pickaxe minimum to be able to break them. Then we have all of the geode nodes, excluding the omni geode one. These can only be found on the little mining patches of the hilltop farm and the four corners farm. These will drop whatever geode they're showing. Then you have the mystic stone, which was excluded because I couldn't find any. Therefore, I couldn't get any of the data that I needed for how many hits it takes for each pickaxe. But I can tell you that it is the rarest rock in the entire game. Despite that, it only gives 50 experience, but it will always drop 1 to 3 iridium ore, 1 to 4 gold ore, and then have a 25% chance for a prismatic shard. They can only be found on floor 100 or higher of the mines, anywhere in the Skull Cavern, and anywhere in the Volcano Dungeon. And it's the only other rock other than the Diamond Node that can be found on floors that are a multiple of 5 in the mines. And that should do it. So many rocks, and now you know all of them. So now that we're at the end of the first part of the mining guide, I want to apologize on how long it took this to come out. I did have to do some of my own testing for some of the stuff because it's just straight up not documented, and that's when I like to make charts. All charts in this video are going to be in the description, by the way, if you want it for your own means. The next part of the mining guide won't take too long. The only reason I split it is because it is a very long video, and that's a lot of intensive editing to do all in a row. So don't worry about that. Thank you all for watching. See you in the next one, and good night.